Welcome to the August 8th Planning Board meeting. This is a work session. We're going to talk about uh, zoning amendments. We have a presentation from staff tonight to go through the details of the proposed zoning amendments. Tonight is not a voting night for us. This is to ask questions of staff, and I hope we can get all our board questions, input, answered, discussed as best we can. Uh, this will be on the agenda on the 18th, and I do expect a vote that night, making a recommendation to council. Uh, there may be changes, but that's all possible. It could be a result of this tonight's discussions. At the end of this presentation and our interaction with staff, uh, public input will be allowed two minutes per person. So with that, I think, Nick, are you prepared to lead us? Yes, I believe so. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, thanks, Rick, for the introduction. Just to reiterate what Rick is saying, the, I think the core purpose of tonight's meeting is to go through in a semi-comprehensive manner what actually is in front of us in respect to the zoning amendments with an understanding we're still, this is still evolving. We're still getting feedback from board members, members of the public, and other participants as this moves through the drafting process. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. There, there are still four main parts to this, and I'm going to, in the PowerPoint, really follow the document you got last week, which has the latest set of revisions. Um, so let me pause it, advance. Okay. So again, the, the core purpose of these building height uh, amendments is really to remove loopholes or ambiguity in the code that has resulted in recent years with some some buildings artificially uh, adding height to the to the property because the existing height definition for at least a couple of decades is uh, exclusively focused on the finished grade of the property. So after the, the land is developed, uh, the, the building height is actually measured off of the finished grade. So it's allowed, as you'll see and have seen in previous meetings, some recent projects to essentially build the first floor on terra firma on the existing property and then backfill around it, create a platform and start measuring from that second story, which becomes the first and the building gets anywhere between eight and 12 feet taller, depending on the floor to floor heights. <clears throat> so we're, we're trying to address that. We're trying to provide consistency across all the character districts and in some cases remove some incorrect references that are still there from 2013 when, when this was initially adopted. We have gone through at least three major amendment processes since 2013. The North End was added in 2014 and there were amendments made to the downtown in, at that time. And then in 2015 when we did the West End a vision plan and adopted that character-based zoning, we also made changes to the North End and some additional ones for downtown. So it, it's high time we come back and, and tweak this further, improve it further to again maintain the consistency and not be surprised in the permitting process with what it generates from um, prospective applicants. So the, the four parts are really looking at the building height map and making some changes to the map itself. The, uh, the second is corner or through lots and inclu it includes waterfront lots like Rains Ave or, or Green Street along the North Mill Pond. Uh, and then number three, part three is talking about the civic districts and part four, both adding new additions and modifying some others. So if we focus first on the building height map as part one, we're really doing three things here that, that are in front of us. One is adding new streets like Foundry Place and um, also adding both sides of a street like Siri Street. It's a good example of a street in 2013 that was added, but we only applied building height standards to the, uh, to the north side of that street. And that was probably because the lots are so narrow on Market Street, there was no need to put a building height standard behind them on Siri Street. But it, it's a good idea in the code to have a building height standard on both sides of every street. So that, that's the goal with that particular amendment. <clears throat> we'll, we'll be able to walk through any of these. I've also got a series of examples uh, that I can present if you need it as part of the discussion that I'm not going to go through uh, 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 proactively, I'll wait for the questions. Um, 
The second thing we're doing is adding building heights or proposing here to add building heights to civic and municipal properties. Currently, civic and municipal properties are exempt from all dimensional controls. There's no building height controls on municipal or civic, and there are no dimensional requirements. Um, and it seems like it would be helpful if the map didn't have all these gaps and had the ability to uh, at least provide some guardrails, general guardrails, as to how new buildings, uh, alterations, additions, and extensions to either municipal or civic properties would integrate themselves into the character-based zoning area. And then thirdly, we, <clears throat> we, the only substantive change to the map, everything's an addition, with the exception of the continued conversation about potentially modifying the building height standard on that one lot on Hanover and High Street. Um, so this map here that you saw in the package, I think it was Exhibit 1, this is all the proposed map changes that are in front of us. And the only, the only change that's been made since our last meeting, maybe five or six weeks ago, is I looked at all the civic properties, and the only one of the nine that did not comport to the proposed building height standard was the South Church. So what's proposed and what you have in front of you is an orange line around the South Church, and every one of those nine <coughs> civic properties is well within the height standard that's being proposed. So we're not creating new nonconformities to any of those properties. Uh, and all the municipal properties uh, are the remainder, uh, with the exception of Foundry Place being added and one side of Siri Street that you can see on this map. Everything else is uh, either civic or municipal. So the, all these lines are new, and the only thing um, that's modified is the Haven Court High Street section. So this is what the map would look like should all this be adopted. And I'll, I'll just back up for a second on Foundry Place. Um, there was a lot of questioning about the Heinemann property and what, what may or may not happen if there was a brown line as originally uh, proposed along the south side of Foundry Place. And currently, the city owns a piece of property between Heinemann and the Foundry Place. And uh, we've come to learn that the uh, owner of Heinemann is interested in potentially purchasing uh, that thin strip behind the building. They have, a, I believe, a license agreement or some type of agreement with the city that's longstanding for the parking behind that building. Um, but because there's the potential of that land transfer to happen, and the goal of this zoning amendment is not to change policy, it's to clean up the map. Uh, I modified that section behind the Heinemann building to a green line which matches the existing green line they already have on Hanover Street. So there's no uh, possibility of this amendment altering the existing development rights of the Heinemann property, whether they buy the section from the city or not. So th those were the only two changes from <coughs> five or six weeks ago on this map. Uh, again, South Church going up um, 10 feet to the orange line to be consistent with the North Church and St. John's uh, and conform to the height requirements and that section behind the Heinemann. Nick? Yes. Just, uh, yep. I know, I think everybody here knows where you're talking about, but since this is okay. a public meeting, when you talk Sorry. about Heinemann property... I forgot all about the mouse. Yep. <laughs> this is the Heinemann, if you can see the arrow, this is the Heinemann building here, what's left of it. Um, used to be a much taller building. This is the parking garage. This is Foundry Place. And this is, this is the only, you know, Peter Hapney at 66 Rock Street is right here, and he actually has no building height standard today. That was a, an error in the original map. He has no height. Um, we don't know what that actually means. Uh, he's thankfully not come in and asked for a permit. But the goal here would be he does have frontage now that Foundry Place has been built on that cul-de-sac. Uh, we're applying the green line. He is in the character-based district. That's the last property uh, in the character-based zoning, and then Heinemann, and then it goes back along here, along Hill Street. So there's Heinemann. There's the green line. The city owns a little bit of land right here between the green line and the back of Heinemann. And then I talked about the South Church right here. That was originally several months ago proposed to be a blue line around that church, which was consistent with everything else around it. But in looking at the, I, I dug out all the building heights from 2013 and went through each of these properties to see how they would shake out with these uh, rubber sheeted lines. Yes. Can we ask questions now? Sure. Yeah. 
Well, uh, Nick, while you're on the uh, Foundry Place area, yep. could you explain how the new zoning will affect DSA Lot 2, if at all? I don't believe it'll affect DSA's Lot 2 at all. And, and Could you, you point know, it out? I'm, what am I doing? Point okay. out where that is. Lot 2 is right here. So the parking garage is this big gray block, and there's Lot 2, and here's Lot 3. Okay. So DSA, just for everybody's benefit, um, DSA uh, had had all of this property when we uh, purchased this, this lot here and Foundry Place for the garage. This was Lot 1. This is lot two, this is lot three, this is four, five, and six is over here behind the former Redland Johnson. I can't remember the name of the company there now. But that's lot six back there, all in, in common ownership uh, by DSA. Ferguson. Ferguson, thank you. Um, so when the building height map was created for the north end in 2014, moving into 15, we didn't have foundry place in order to create building heights to implement the, the the vision plan down foundry place we knew we wanted to build the street and have these buildings but we didn't have any street to put any building heights on so lot two today has no building height standard uh i'll come back to answer your question in just a second uh jim uh, lot three has a very small section right here i'm going to show you on the next slide right here this brown line is already, so that's a brown lot. It's 50 feet, and it, it, it used the community space to get to 60 feet. It's already been approved as a hotel. That's this lot here. This is the little bank that was approved for a four-story building, 50 feet in height, with no incentive. Uh, but that was not fully approved, so that needs to come back. And it's under new ownership, and it's likely to be a whole new design for lot four, which is the bank property. The same owner that purchased Lot 4 purchased Lot 5, which is the Wells Fargo building at the corner, the former train station. They're currently in front of the HDC. They may have been to planning board for design review. They are proposing to do a 60-foot building there using the incentives for community space. The two lots that are back here near the garage that are still owned by, I believe, DSA, uh, they both have, uh, they're in the permitting process of starting construction. And both those buildings are approximately 60 feet in height, just under 60 feet. And you can see there's a brown line on Hill Street going up beside Ferguson. Uh, and that was primarily done to support the building down on Foundry Place because we didn't have Foundry Place at the time in order to put these lines here. So that, that's proposed to be brown on both sides right here, and then brown along the garage, presuming we do the municipal properties which it can, it can happen or not. Um, Peter Hapney definitely needs some kind of color down here, so he has a building height standard. And this green line that, that's recent here is to make sure there's, in this particular set of amendments, there's no repositioning of the, the Heinemann property for any more intensive development than it already has. So I'll go back to the question that was asked, which is what's the status of Lot 2? As best I know it, Jim, because I'm, I'm not necessarily the, the authority, but uh, I know that when we purchased the property in the post-closure agreement with the, the Rogers uh, folks, we, uh, are, we're getting that, and they've, they've permitted that lot to be used as community space. So the end use of Lot 2 is to be conveyed to the city and improved as a park between the parking garage and the hotel. But I, my recollection is that that transaction hasn't occurred yet, partly because the hotel hasn't been built and it's, it's going to be used as a staging area during construction and then improved and conveyed to the city. So that will be a municipal property uh, at some point once the hotel starts construction. But as either a, pay, a staging area, lay down lot, or a park, yes, it should not have 50 feet. <clears throat> It, it could be whatever anybody wants it. But if that deal falls apart, yeah, and that is privately sold because they renege on their $800,000 and the whole, thing, the whole deal falls apart and ends up in litigation, that could be a building instead of a park. Absolutely. And it was, it, it, the North End Vision Plan makes it very clear. Things can change now six or seven years later. But the Vision Plan was clear that was a 60-foot district. The point is, is when a project, when a, when a property is in play, I'll use the words in play. That's under litigation. It's 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 
final use is mysterious, just like one Congress Street. It's in play. I, I, giving, making a change is giving the owner private benefit. Well, you, you may interpret it that way, but if the, vi if the vision plan for the city that was adopted by the city and it reflected in the zoning that was put in place sees tall buildings potentially going even in on lot two, that, that's a policy question that people have to answer. That's right. And making yeah, that's changes is, is a private benefit. It's, it, it's always a private benefit to make a change mm -hmm. if the benefit is actually expanding property rights. And we are. You, you would be in that case. So we, we shouldn't be we, giving we have We have several options of how to proceed with this. Yep. The, the map that has been prepared basically fills in all of the gaps, including the cemetery, for you know, a building height designation. And that's one way to do it. You can take a map like this and designate everything, which is what has been done. You can put words in the ordinance to address the same sorts of things without having the whole map. Exactly. <clears throat> As we get to a vote for council, if a member proposes that, you know, this particular property maybe ought to have a different color or no color, you can say that and make a motion to that effect. Let's not argue about it. You made your point. I think it's a good point. You know, you, you, you made your point well. Um, but let's, let's talk about what's happening. We've got that one on next to the garage. I know we're going to hear from other people. We've heard from other people already that there are other sites that maybe the, the colors might want to change a little bit or go away. Mm -hmm. But let's be specific about things that are technically a workshop discussion. Well, that was a workshop discussion that we're giving and you did. private benefit. And you did, and I thank you. I'm done. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just follow up by saying there's a real simple answer to that. If the deal was to fall apart, they'd merge the lot and it'd be 60 feet. That's the status quo if we don't get that lot. They merge it with the lot next to it, and it would have a 60-foot height today. That's the default position. So if we want to remove development rights, that's what's before you, not adding them. Okay. Um, anything else? Thanks. So I have four examples of each of these areas that we've talked about at the last meeting. I'm going to skip past them and come back if you wish to talk about what's happening actually on Foundry Place, which I think we just covered, but Siri Street, uh, the Civic and Municipal map changes, and High Street and Haven Court. So the only other change to the building height map is this Scribner's error, which we probably could have just made, but it, in the interest of transparency, uh, it, it 47 does not exist, and it's 46, and that's how we've dealt with it over the last eight years. So I think that concludes part one. Uh, and if yes, yep, so if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, so there was questions raised about the noticing on this, and we had sat down with our legal team to make sure that all these were properly published and noticed in accordance with the state statutes. I just wanted to draw some attention to RSA 675 colon 7, um, which provides that if we are not changing a boundary, changing the minimum lot size, or the proposed uses. If the district is less than 100,000, we do not, I mean, le less than 100 um, property owners affected, it does not require the same abutter notification. So that is really, took us a minute because we made that, we worked with legal on that a while back. So we developed, we have a whole host of changes here, but this particular one raised some interest about abutter notices. And this is a, uh, a state statute that did not require it because it was very limited in scope. So I just wanted to offer that clarification. Thank you. Shall I proceed? Yes. Okay. Part two is looking at how corner through and waterfront lots are dealt with. And I think we've all learned a lot from Congress Street, uh, those of you that are here. We've dealt with this routinely for the last eight years at the HDC and previous planning boards. Uh, we've not had any issues until recently in interpretation as to how you apportion the building heights uh, that can be multiple on one lot if it's a through lot moving from, for, for example, State Street to Sheaf Street and it's the same property with different height standards. We feel like it's very clear uh, the, the way it's written, uh, but it, it could be a little, a, a little tightened up to avoid um, debates or conflicts or any ambiguity in how you apportion the building height on corner or through lots. So that's part of uh, the change in part two. And 
uh, just tweaking the definitions. And oh, sorry, the first part of part two, so 2A, is I think a really important part, um, which is a, a statement, uh, almost a disclaimer in the code that makes it very clear to the reader, the applicant, the board members, the public, that within the historic district, the HDC or the Historic District Commission has jurisdiction over height, mass, scale, and volume of the building. And they are not obligated just because the code says you can build up to 60 feet or up to 50 feet. They are not obligated to approve that building at that maximum height if they feel it does not meet their criteria. And most of them have known that most of the time I've been here, but there's been a variety of interpretations uh, well, I've been here for 11 years and before as to whether the HDC can tell somebody to do a 55-foot building in a 60-foot 60, 60 district. It's obviously it can't be arbitrary. It has to meet the criteria. They have to defend their, their ground if they're going to lower it. But this is, I think, a really important, again, statement for all readers, uh, and in particular the HDC, to feel comfortable that, you know, sometimes that, that building height map is not going to be perfect, that's for sure. It's going to have instances where five or six feet makes a difference. Um, so that, that's 2A, and then 2B, as I said a minute ago, is wordsmithing how you apportion building height on these corner, through, or waterfront lots. And uh, a, a good idea somebody brought to me was, you know, we've already got street or public place that's in there, but we don't have a definition for public place, so we created one of those, which will come up in a minute when we get to the definition section. But why not embed street in public place so we don't have an either or, which led us into the am supposed ambiguity about how you apportion something like Congress Street from down High Street to Haven Court. I don't want to focus on that project, but I think most of you have seen it and you know enough about it. We want to avoid um, wasting time in um, dealing with administrative appeals or just even conversations about what is meant. We've been doing it this way for for eight years. It makes sense. 50 feet is a very conservative uh, buffer from a street edge. So if you're on a, you're, if you've got a property that's uh, 150 feet deep and you've got a taller uh, building height standard on one end of the property versus the other, the lower building height standard is protecting the, the street for 50 feet back before you can actually jump up to the higher level. So it's a high degree of protection. I would say Portsmouth is very conservative with a number like 50. It could easily be 20. Uh, but we don't, we're not changing it. We're leaving it at 50. I just want people to understand what it is and why it's important to this section. Nick, I think, I think there was a question on A. On, on A, and sorry. If you, could, if you could just pause at the end of each one and look at me, and I'll just kind of okay. look around and make sure everybody's good with each, because we're, this is really meaty stuff. And I just want to, as I said, I want to make sure folks are comfortable with it before you jump on to the next. So we're, you know, yep. so I think Jim had a question. And Nick, I want to go back to your statement about the confusion or maybe some people have di different interpretations about when a zone or color has different stories. Like it's, you know, yellow or green or blue, it says two to four yeah. stories. Yes. Based on what you just said, I interpret that to mean only the HDC can dictate how tall that building will be between two and four. Is that correct? If you're in the historic district, right. the HDC is the only governing uh, board that has any jurisdiction over building height. So you could, by inference, conclude that. But the a, a, a property owner within the historic district that's on a a green line that says two to three stories or 40 feet has the right to come in and ask for a 40-foot building that's three stories tall. It just may be the HDC might not want to see it quite that tall. Right, and but I just want to make sure that it's only the HDC that can back that height down. I would agree with that. Okay, because as you know, when people see this range, that at least I was initially, I was confused, like, well, what's that really mean? The range is we... They always go to the very tallest, so why do you have a range? Well, the, ra the, the range is done, it's a good point, and that there's a lot of things that are sometimes unintended outcomes. We would have expected most people to come in with the tallest building. They've been doing it since the dawn of time, right? So that's why we have a, we have a building height map that's basically, I make the mistake of calling it a street-based building height map, but it's really not street-based. It's block by block. 
and some blocks are going to have multiple colors because of the, the methodology that was used to create it was to be very nuanced, very sort of surgical, and look at the existing building heights in the surrounding context and notice that there's a very big difference between Market Square and Fleet Street and Chestnut Street, but yet before we did the character-based zoning, everything was 60 feet downtown no matter where you were. Sheaf Street was no different than Market Square. So we've got this, again, nuanced, refined building height map, and we don't want single-story buildings in the district. That, that we knew, uh, meaning just one floor downtown, is really out of character with Portsmouth. So the decision was made, we don't want, want single-story buildings. There might be some two-story buildings that work, so let's create a range between two and the max. We certainly were well aware we're not going to get too many that are on the low end, but the low end is to prevent the single from happening, underutilizing the, the space. If I can help with this, uh, many current character-based or form-based codes only specify stories, and so they would say, they wouldn't say two to three, it would say three. In Portsmouth, we have a height maximum, so it's 20, 35, 40, 50, 60, and within that height maximum, you can have a range of stories that gets you to that height. So <clears throat> depending on how tall your ceilings are, you can have a 40-foot building that's just two floors, right? or it could be several floors. That's, that's where you get the range. It's not, it's not that we as a planning board have discretion to say, well, you're proposing a four-story building, we only want two. It's the height, the foot limitation that provides the upper threshold. Well, the HTC does have the authority to say they have we, that don't authority. Have, we don't want a four-story building, we want a two. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah, again, and I don't want to give anybody the, the misimpression that they can just cavalierly do that. They've got to be very careful, judicious, uh, and have a good reason to, to do that. But I, I like believe... Like the master plan or something like that? Well, looking at their criteria and looking at the, the, the site within its context, I mean, they've got, they've got pretty detailed criteria. I think they're open to interpretation, which is both good and, and maybe bad. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, we went through this on 77 State Street when Steve Kellen came in for the Exxon gas station and converted that into the building that's at the bottom of that street with the, the wine bar or whatever it is. Uh, it's a mansard, and he had a full extra story on that when he filed. And the HDC um, cajoled or uh, encouraged him to consider a penthouse and drop a story, and that's what he did. So it's a 53-foot building instead of a 60-foot building. And yes, you can, from the bridge you can see the penthouse, but when you're in the uh, parking lot or on State Street, you don't see the penthouse. That's an example of the HDC having jurisdiction to not, n not just say nothing about height. Okay. It's nothing new. It's, a, it's just stating something yes, that's been it's not the case. New. So, oh. Andrew, you had a... Uh, to Jim's question, f future zoning notwithstanding, I think the Heinemann is an example of that. Is that right? Where? Example of what? Where the oh, that's the height of the first zoning the floor. dictates one, but then the historic district would. Heinemann is not in the historic district, so they they won't be reviewed. Lot six, lot three for DSA, not in the historic district, so those buildings are likely to be quite different sure. than they would have on lot four and five. Imperfect again, uh, maps, right? Okay, any other questions on that one? Are there questions on 2B? It's fairly straightforward, wordsmithing. Mm -hmm. The definition of public place will come up in, in the part four so you can better understand what that is. It's, it's not magic. Oh, and the last sort of part, I guess I'll call it 2C, and this in your document is listed under the definition section, which is the last part, but I, it fits here because it, it, it's hand in glove with this section of the code right here, we just talked about how you apportion um, building height on lots that have more than one color because they're corner or through lots. You need to know what the definition of front lot line is and we're wanting to make it super explicit. Waterfront lots are just like corner and through lots with multiple colors and importantly, just because your principal front yard, which is where your address is allocated to the, to the property, does not in any way uh, omit the building height standard on the secondary street. Again, AKA one Congress. High Street and Congress are both building height standards that apply to that property, in our opinion. And 
we're trying to make it even more explicit to avoid what we all just went through. Any questions on that? I, the example you see on the screen is, is State Street. Just these are all, most of the, these are all through lots with different building height standards on Chief, as you'd expect. It's a two and a half story neighborhood. This is a three story neighborhood. The average height's about nine feet different and lower on Chief from State. So any, we can come back, but are we good there? Yes. Okay. So we're into part three, which is the civic districts and the proposal to, again, put some general um, guardrails on civic properties. They have no building height cap. They can be as tall as they want. They have no setbacks, no coverage, no footprint. There, there are no standards in the existing code. And we've actually only had two projects in the last eight years come before us. The Warner House that's shown in the lower the image at the bottom, they came in and were building, their, they haven't started, I don't think yet, the accessory building on Chapel Street. And um, they went to the Board of Adjustment. I'm not sure we fully knew at the time they went that maybe they didn't need to go because there's no standards. It seems so um, surprising to us that there were no standards for these civic properties. And just so everybody knows, civic properties, the civic districts, we have nine in the character uh, district area. And I think I've got a map in here, but it's like the Warner House, the, the John Paul Jones, and, um, and, and others, Langdon. They, um, they need to be owned by a nonprofit, and they need to be generally op open to the general public. That's why the Athenaeum is not here. Uh, the doors are locked, and you, you need a key to get in. Um, it's certainly a nonprofit, but um, so the, we have nine of them here. We used to have ten. The Salvation Army was sold. It was converted to a, a residential use. It because of that, it needed a zoning amendment change. It became CD4 from Civic, and we assigned a building height standard so they could redevelop that property. That was done by the City Council probably two to three years ago. Um, but that's the process for changing from a Civic property to a non-Civic. But the issue that we're, you know, at least wanting to have here is some predictability. If any of these uh, museums or properties want to add new buildings, alterations or additions, that there be at least some modicum of, of dimensional standards that everybody else has, including every other civic property in this, the city of Portsmouth that is not in the downtown. Think of the Spinney Road North Church property. That has dimensional controls all over it. It's in the SRA. You've got the Little Harbor Chapel. You've got stuff on Woodbury, Lafayette. All those civic properties have dimensional controls, but these don't. And again, this doesn't have to happen. It's not going to change the world, but it seems like everybody should have uh, an understanding of, of what might happen before it happens. P Peter? Oh. What, so if, you, if we did put these on the, the civic properties, would the process be the same if they were to change to a private or you know a different prop so if one of property if i understand your question if one of these nine remaining civic properties in the downtown area were to change to a non-civic use they would be disqualified from being civic as soon as they propose to become something else they would need to go to the city council right now and ask for a zoning amendment and the zoning amendment would change them probably to cd4 or cd5 it would have to be a character district that's not civic. Similar to what the Salvation Army would do. Correct, exactly. Let's say that the new height things are in place now. Yes. Would the same situation be the case? Most likely. I mean, they, they'd have the ability if they were to sell to somebody and all nine will, will, will conform. Let's say somebody buys the Langdon house and wants to do something there and it's taller than the blue line which is i believe 35 feet quote me on that it's two and a half stories if they wanted to have something taller and they wanted to change that from civic to non-civic they could ask at that time like the salvation army to which was ad asking for a new building height standard that didn't exist they could amend the code if the city felt it was in the city's interest there's no intention here to make anything any more difficult for anybody and looking at the CD4 just so everybody is clear on this because it's not intuitive 
the CD5 and the CD4, you, you guys, again, have got a good education from Congress Street because that parking lot, CD4, and the rest of it, CD5. There's almost no difference between the four and the five. It's, it's so inconsequential. For example, the building height coverage, how much of the land you can cover with a building in the CD5 is 95% of the site. You're thinking, wow, that's pretty urban. The CD4 is 90%. They're almost the same, and all the uses are the same. So there isn't a really big difference between the four and the five, and that just goes to show you when you look at these or think of these museums or civic properties, they are so lightly developed for the CD4 that this is not going to have a discernible impact on them at all. They, you know, Some of them could expand six-fold before they'd hit that ceiling because they generally are bigger properties with smaller buildings. So the intention here isn't to spawn development. Remember, right now they have no rules. So there's no rules, no caps. That's infinity. Uh, and we're, we're trying to put something on that that's way above what's there, but at least some guardrails to give some people some predictability. Does that sort of answer your question, Peter? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Keep going? Keep going. Okay. Please. So the next slide simply refers to the CD4 standards. That's what that 10C is the CD4. And I have an example, should you want to see it, as to what the table looks like in CD4. Um, but trust me, they, they have a lot of room to grow. Uh, okay, so we're in the fourth part, which is the final part. And it's the definitions that are either being added or modified. So we're adding new definitions for public place. We already have public place in the code, just not defined. So that we're adding a definition. You see it bolded in the, the previous slide, but that's only because everything in the code is bolded where there's a definition in the back of the book. So that's why that is bolded. Uh, but public place is already there. It's just not defined. We're, we've created through uh, a great deal of effort and conversation how to deal with cuts and fills with building height. This, this looked to me a lot easier at the beginning than it ended up being. Uh, you know, those images you see on the right-hand side, which have been here from day one, they're the, that ended up being the easy part, uh, trying to stop that uh, or minimize that or control that. Those, all three of those buildings built the, what's now the basement on top of the ground, more or less, and backfilled around it, and all three of those are able to measure off the finished grade, because that's the way it works today, repeating myself. Uh, and we're trying to tackle that by looking at not just the average finished grade, but the average existing grade, and take whatever's lower. So we deal with both fill situations, which were the easier ones to visualize, but also cuts. As most of you know, most of the land in Portsmouth and everywhere else uh, in New England isn't flat. And it's either got a, a cut or a fill associated with construction. And the big change here is we're going to require height to be measured off existing grade previous to construction and post and take whatever's. And obviously, the post isn't after construction. It's, it's what's projected to be after construction when they're in the permitting process. And whichever's lower is going to be the standard that we apply to, again, prevent situations where Taller buildings than we anticipated uh, arrive on the landscape. And I'm not suggesting they're all bad uh, outcomes, but we, we don't even have a say in the game uh, right now when they do that. So uh, that's the first part of 4A and then 4B, which is labeled number two there, are some modified definitions. We already did the front lot line up, up above where I think it made more sense. So it's really the building height definition, penthouses, mansard roofs, and short stories. So public place is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, a pub, it's a street, way, park, pedestrian alleyway, or community space. It's essentially anywhere that provides public access. So our building height map, wherever you have one of these things, should have a building height on both sides uh, of that public place. In order to differentiate between sort of downtown or urban environments and suburban environments, or non-urban, we have created a definition of urban districts, and this corresponds to how you measure building height should any of this get adopted. In an urban district, which are the character and civic districts, again, downtown, 
you would we're, what we're concerned and focused on is the height of the building along a public place along a street along a way along an alley we don't care be, what's going on between or behind that building in respect to its relationship to a pedestrian on the street or how we experience that building so the the main difference uh, or differentiation of urban to non-urban is focusing in on the street level facades not the entire perimeter of the building which is how it'll work in the non-urban areas so you will like i said earlier somebody's going to have to calculate the definite the uh, average existing grade for the the building in which they want to build and they're going to have to do the same thing for the average finish grade and the, the definition of building height will look at both of those and take the lower again so we avoid the fills and avoid the, the, the hill sites that are cut from artificially elevating the height of the building beyond what the code intended. So this is just finished grade. They're essentially the same definition uh, existing and finished with those words being inter interchanged. Nick, Nick real yeah, quick. Sorry. Real quick, Nick. So you get rid of the six foot offset and you just measure on the outside walls? Uh, did we actually do that? Yes. I, I think. Yeah, we did. Okay, thanks, Rick. I couldn't remember. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting lost myself, but um, it'll all be a little bit clearer when we get in the definition of building height where the measurement piece is embedded, yep. right? Right. That'll help me, which we happen to be at. Um, so in, in measuring the height of a building, you not only need to look at the average existing and average finished, um, and take whatever's lowest that becomes your lower reference point where you start measuring every five feet around the building you're taking measurements um, from that low reference point lower reference point meaning either the average existing or average finished the upper we'll get to in just a second so you gotta where do you stop measuring as you go up the building when you go up the building you either have a flat building or you have a sloped roof building so a flat roof or a sloped roof flat roof is uh, is what it is uh it's flat or it's a flat top mansard a mansard that's only got one roof plane and then kind of like burger king uh it, it's not got windows in it it's just a flat plane and then most of the roof is flat and flat roof is defined in the code as a roof that's under a four four one four to one pitch uh for more than 50 percent of the roof surface if you're in one of those things as either a flat top building or a flat top answer, you're gonna measure from that lower reference point, the average existing or average finished grade, all the way to the top of the building. That, that hasn't changed uh, in the code here. That's why nothing under B1 is changed. What's changed is um, we're clarifying here that the hip top mansard roof, which is shown in the existing zoning as, as getting the same 50% discount in height that gables, gambrels, um, uh, other hip roofs anything that's pitched you measure to the midpoint of the roof because it's backing away from the cornice and it's not um, as visible and has a very different interface with the street than a flat wall think think sort of port walk uh, with the flat roof buildings so we're just trying to clarify here that past practice has been for a long time many decades that hip top mansard roofs get the same credit that gable gambrel and hip roofs get and the other piece that uh, I, I added in here for discussion is uh, penthouses penthouses right now uh, are allowed and they are considered attics just like gables gambrels hips and hip top mansards penthouses are also considered attics all five of those all five of those are already not defined as stories they're not stories they're considered attics so if you have a two to three story green line you can build a three and a half story building provided you don't go over the 40 foot um, height requirement in, in feet so um, penthouses are, are currently and always have been treated as attics but they've not been given any of the benefits of all the other attic type roof forms and remember a penthouse is right now required to be 15 feet back from all roof edges you know a mansard is is right on the roof edge uh, and the mansard gets credit for half the roof it goes to the midpoint 
So what, I, what I'm suggesting we at least, I'm going to go to the definition of penthouse and then toggle back, that we consider is pushing the penthouse even five feet further from the, the, the facade of the building along a public place or a street to 20 feet, but allow it to not only not be a story, but give it the same 50% credit that every other attic space gets. So they're apples and apples. Related to this, but not on the screen, there was a change in the distance of the railing. Yeah, you know, that's, yes, there was. And the <laughs> railing had nothing to do with a penthouse. So oh, I thought it was on the penthouse story that we, no. had to, we changed the distance of the railing from the outside of the building. No, there's a, Greg, I'll look that up in a minute okay. when I finish, but okay. there, there is a current requirement. I thought of that today going through this. I'm like, where, where's that piece in the presentation? Okay. Um, there is a requirement in the code, and I'll fish it out when we get finished here and give you a better answer. But uh, there, there's a sort of obscene uh, setback requirement in my mind in respect to the, the how far back a railing has to be uh, from a roof edge. It, it's up to four feet in height and has to be two or more times back, which it, is odd, uh, you know, especially if, if you don't completely dislike the penthouse on 100 Market Street, which to me is really effectively done that is on the outside bearing wall and it's a decorative railing and it works that appears to be way out of line with what was required whenever that was adopted so that that's the spirit of what i was trying to get to but we'll go but that's a great example so uh, whatever the setback is of the wall from that railing at that particular building we're moving it from 15 to 20 in this ordinance yes okay yeah yeah and and for what it's worth 100 market street is an eight foot st step back okay. uh, and it, it it's pretty pretty effective uh so yeah i think 20 i'm gonna go, go back to penthouse or figure out where it went so move to 20 from 15 give it the same uh 50 discount that everybody else gets it's an attic it's not a story it isn't today and the last part on there uh, is to not, dis not discourage that they have not always flat roofs, that they have, a a like the one you see in the middle on Bow Street, it, it, a shallow hip roof. If we, if we don't provide some wiggle room for that, that penthouse to be a little bit taller in order to have a pitched roof, the skyline of the city is turning into a box. And we, we have to be, and again, it's maybe more my opinion than everybody else's, that's why we're here. Uh, the HDC certainly agrees with what I'm saying because they're, de they're dealing with the aesthetics of these buildings and the skyline and the edge of roof treatment. And we're finding that most new buildings are so tight against the maximum height, there's no room to add even an articulated or raised cornice or parapet that would really in, improve the look and feel of downtown Portsmouth. It, again, I think most of the HDC would agree with that. I've, I've, I've been working with them a long time and, and heard that repeatedly. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a second. Um, Andrew has a question. I'm sorry, Andrew. Yeah, really brief. Uh, 51 Islington Street is sort of a combination of that where it's partially mansard and then partially penthouse, or I think what could be classified as a penthouse only because there are exterior balconies and railings how is something like that measured and how do you think that are we looking to achieve something more to that effect or what is the direction so I've, i i don't know that i've ever been on the roof of 51 islington street it's certainly not since it's been finished so i i can't really remember or envision that space but i can tell you what the intent is the the penthouse is actually the structure not the ancillary decks or railings okay. that may or may not be present um and and obviously even the stairwell is an appendage to the penthouse to get up there or the elevator overrun. So it's intended to be, as it is today, no greater than 50% of the floor below in, in footprint, not more than 10 feet in height if it's flat, or 14 if it has a pitched roof. You get a 50% discount on that, like the uh, other sloped roofs that already get that discount. And whether you have a roof deck that goes out to the cornice or halfway back, that's really up to the HDC if it's in the district and the owner if it's not. Okay. Nick? Yep. Can you speak to, to the bottom of the photograph? You obviously put it there for a reason to speak to your, your point. What was it about that photograph and those the combination of roofs that supported your point? 
Okay, well, 100 Market Street, that's it on the right, right? No, the bottom the left. left. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you say left. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's just, a, it's a mansard roof uh, on the corner, and there's no magic to it other than that's not considered uh, a story. Yeah. Is, would that actually yeah. be, within our current zoning language, would you actually consider that a mansard roof? Yes. Pardon me, but, Joe, and for folks speaking. Well, you pull the mic up. Speak closer sorry. to the microphone. Thanks. Okay, due to, due to its very high, I mean, obviously it's a very successful, you know, a great example of everything we love about well, downtown, but-, but it, that, I believe it has two roof planes. There's yeah. one above there, so it's gonna qualify. There's a new definition in a, a subsequent slide here of mansard roof, differentiating a flat top from a hip top. I believe this is probably a hip top. If we got up a little higher, there'd be another roof plane. It's punctuated but with those windows. It's probably at the 3012 pitch, which is pretty vertical. Yep. There are dimensional requirements in the code today as to what, it can't be a flat wall. It can't exceed 3012. Right. So presuming it doesn't uh, uh, exceed that, it would count as an attic, it would count as a mans hip top mansard, but it would violate the height requirement because there's no discount, I'm calling it, uh, like other sloped roofs. Uh, I'm sorry, that's wrong. If it's a hip top, it gets the mid. Yes, I don't know why I said that. I've, I'm stuck, st still stuck on penthouses. Yeah, so that, that would be measured to the midpoint of that roof between the eave the the ridge and the eave you take the midpoint with any of these pitched roofs sorry sorry i did that i don't want to confuse people everybody understand that or do you need us to, to see a mouse on that oh you know? i'm sorry <laughs> that's that's the hip top mansard there and i apologize rick i keep forgetting so the, the, the so the height of the building would be to here uh where the arrow is it, i i suspect the, the location of that of where it actually bends and changes to another roof plane yeah probably the, the the height of where it ch makes that transition might be problematic might be in today's uh, yeah yeah okay i mean i i don't have the math on that yeah but um okay yeah this one here is more the penthouse scenario anyway one more the, well if you're gonna go into the mansard roof definition i'll let you i'll let you yeah dive into uh, it. okay and then uh my is that I'll go there now. I, I, all right, how about that? So modify the definition of a mansard roof. If you read the definition we have today, uh, I'm surprised this hasn't come up before recently, uh, the, the problem I see with the current definition. The current definition does not really differentiate between a flat top and a hip top, which is really not appropriate. They're, they're very different roof forms. The flat top, again, being generally one-sided instead of two, and most of the roof being flat, which again is defined in the code as less than 4, 412 pitch. So um, what we're attempting to do here with the new definition is be very clear. Flat tops are this, and hip tops are that, and hip tops get the, the sloped roof benefit, and flat tops do not. Very similar to the diagram we want to delete, not, not because that's wrong, but because this diagram that's in there now, which, which has functioned fairly well, will not function well with urban and non-urban areas and how we measure building height. But if you look at this, which is in the code today, this is a flat top mansard right here. I think it's, it's even labeled flat top mansard. So this has been in the code for decades. And that is what a, that's a parapet on there, just a railing system, but it's one plane, no windows, and you would measure this from the finished grade to the, t to the top of the parapet if it's over two feet. If it's under two feet, you'd, you'd use the roof. But it, you get the idea. This is treated like a flat building. A gambrel or a gable or a, a hip roof or a hip top mansard, anything with a pitch on it, you're gonna go to the midpoint. So we agree with this. We've been doing it this way. We're going to continue to do it that way um, if this, well, if it passes. And the definition will hopefully make it much clearer the difference between a flat and a hip top mansard. Go ahead. So the upper roof still has to have the four to one slope? Meet the definition of a sloped roof. The upper, you, you need two roof planes. Right. And you need to have no more, what you need to do if you are a hip top mansard is make sure no more than 50% of your roof surface is flat. So, so you, like, like one Congress, pitching it down into a well 
is not a violation of a hip top mansard <laughs> as long as that well and it's actually a pretty innovative idea to hide all the mechanicals because yeah. if you look at 25 Maplewood, which went the other way and took a very big footprint and pushed it to the middle to have it be more traditional with a, uh, a roof you, that projects outward instead of inward, all the mechanical stuff is, is stuck on top on a very flat section, and you can see it from all over the place. So at least allowing the recessed um, area allows for the kinds of rooftop mechanicals which are on all these buildings right in right. spades okay and so i yeah i just want to make sure that that upper pitch portion still has to meet the definition correct of a pitch whether it's this way or this way yeah still has to yes it does then, yeah and then and then what as long as you're not exceeding the 50 percent right. in the middle you can okay. drop down and hide things great popovers it for what it's worth i have been out there i have been up there popovers has a big recessed area in the middle of that mansard roof to house mechanical uh, so does i think the porter street townhouses have the same big well in the middle of the roof as this 40 bridge street okay yeah i mean it's a good technique to hide that stuff okay let me see what i see. the parapet wall and this is where i thought greg of the, the railing where'd that go um Again, this is this is really an HDC ask in respect to just having the ability to have a little more interest on the top yeah. of the building edge. And out. two feet is proven to be not enough to do an articulated or, or raised cornice or a parapet wall that's that's different. And again, you think of two Russell Street, which is the the big parking lot on Deer Street that's currently in front of multiple boards. It's got a very large building in the middle with a, almost a I don't know, a 30, 35,000 square foot footprint. And it's got, it's modularized as you come up Russell Street into Deer. And all the HDC was trying to do with the applicant, both parties wanting to do it, was bring the roof up a little bit in the middle so it really has a, a sense of entry when you look at the building because it has so many, you know, segments coming around the corner. Uh, just think of the Athenaeum and what that roof form does, which is way more than four feet. But the idea of the Athenaeum sweeping up really creates some interest in Market Square. And you're not able to really do anything like that unless you give up the story behind it, which is obviously not going to happen. Yeah, you brought up another good example with the Athenaeum. I think so many times I'm always very guarded about um, some examples that we all cherish and love so much, whether it's the Rockingham Hotel or the, the little roof on the corner there I just pointed out, or the sometimes the language, an unintended consequence of modern zoning eliminates the ability for those things to be done as well. Um, what I like about this is the, the four feet allows for the parapet to be to serve as a guardrail as well. Um, so you don't have the, uh, the, added, the added guardrail for access to the roof, you know, for code, for code purposes. Um, so, uh, you know, another benefit I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, even our concept plan for the McIntyre, we've got a potential railing system on that building that if it's limited to two feet, it, it pretty much guarantees what's above it is visible. You know, if you have a roof deck and you're only allowed to go up two feet with a masonry wall, then you're going to put a railing system on it uh, of some sort. And, you know, it would be nice in some instances to have it be more opaque and bring that masonry wall up. So I'm in agreement with that. And, you know, these examples on here, nobody's trying to push, you know, 19th century uh, cornice treatments. I just grabbed some images and put them on. But th these are heavier cornices that, uh, to Joe's point, we're finding in choosing 40, 50, and 60 foot building heights that the industry standard for three, four, and five story buildings is almost 40, 50, 60 feet. There's like no extra space. So they're running up against the 60 or the 50 or the 40 as soon as they get the ceiling of the top floor done. So they actually can only get two feet uh, that's allowed as an appurtenance above it. There's, there's usually inches left, if any. So having four will create some wiggle room. It's not gonna create four foot parapets on everything. It might create some threes, some two and a halves, but it, it's going to give us some ability, I think, at the HDC level to have some more interesting caps on these buildings. Keep going, sorry. Uh, I'm backing up just to make sure I didn't skim over anything. Okay, uh, I didn't now. 
So we did the penthouse, we did the definition. Last slide. Uh, this is late to the party here, but this is another one that you know came up as part of the Congress Street review. We the, the definition is there without the words flat top, and it makes zero sense. It conflicts with at least three other sections of the code. A top story below a cornice of a sloped roof that, that's at a height uh, 80 percent. I'm not seeing what's behind. Uh, read it up here. At least 20 percent shorter than the height of the story below. That that's what you find in most of our federal architecture. Whether it's Starbucks or down State Street, you'll find the third floor of many federal buildings has a compressed third floor. It's shorter windows. That that makes sense under one. But number two makes zero sense. A story within a mansard roof with a pitch no greater than 3012, that's a short story. The definition of attic makes very clear in the code that a hip top mansard, which is a type of mansard, is not a story. And we have not been treating hip top mansards as stories for eight years. I didn't realize uh, this is what we've always interpreted it to be. We haven't had any flat top, thankfully, mansards. But that's what should be a short story. Um, anyway, or, or we have to change the definition of attic. I mean, you have to go one way or the other. And I think common sense would suggest this is, this is the intention here. Um, hip tops are not stories, full or short. All right, I think I'm, I made it through there, Rick. Any other questions? Nick, um, oh, wait, wait, Jim, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, I think I've asked this before, Nick, but is there going to be a possibility, since we're now adding height to Foundry Place, that Hill Street would drop down to green to be more in tune to all of the buildings that are surrounding that street in that area? Jim, I'm not surprised somebody asked that question. I've asked it a few uh, times, but yeah. I'm going to make no. sure it happens one way or another. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I was here six weeks ago, uh, and if not, uh, two or three weeks before that, the second last meeting, suggesting that we go in that direction. Yeah. And then I woke up to the fact that, you know, that actually would trigger a notice requirement. We're also not here to diminish people's property rights or add to them. Obviously, the exception to that is the Congress Street uh, five-foot piece. Everything else is neutral, and at least in my mind it was. So... Um, I definitely agree that, I think I explained earlier in this presentation, the reason Hill Street is brown is because we didn't have Foundry Place. Exactly. So now that we have Foundry Place and we're going to make it presumably brown uh, to match what's been previously approved, uh, not built yet, but approved, um, we, we could take another pass at looking at that whole Hill Hanover Street and maybe Rock Street neighborhood. I think it needs a more comprehensive review. There, as I'm sure most of you are aware, you know, there's discussions about the downtown overlay district, and is it appropriate to have on the parking lot in front of Heinemann? I, I, I'd agree it probably isn't. You know, I, don't, I can't imagine that neighborhood wants commercial uses in front of the Heinemann, but that, that's a question that needs to be answered in a public process. This, the overlay district, which does not include the parking lot, meaning the incentive overlay district, only includes Heinemann and uh, Lot 6 and everything down on Foundry Place. You know, I think that's, that's open for discussion, but people do need to look at the North End Vision Plan and see the preliminary height numbers, which are all 60 feet, all down Foundry Place. Uh, you know, some of the renderings show shorter buildings, but in the translation of the, uh, the, the North End Vision into the code, it's pretty clear the reason the numbers went down 10 feet on all those streets was because of the incentive overlay district getting them back up to what people w said they could accept, uh, but get the public benefits of either the workforce housing or the community space. So I, I think that's something we should, uh, the, the land use committee or somebody, I, I'd be more than willing to work uh, with whomever to reevaluate that neighborhood and make sure we got it right. Nick, could you, I, and I don't know if this is a question for you or, or Beverly, you, you said it's a notice problem. Because I, I also support the idea of Hill Street being green on both sides. Why is that a notice problem? So I think Taking we, way rights. yeah, I think we looked at it in a couple different ways. And I think Nick is really very, uh, you know, um, 
uh, adeptly kind of laid out the three reasons we looked at that we had a published notice so it wasn't a butter notice it was a published notice and we thought this maybe fell outside the scope of what was published we hadn't included it originally because it does take away because it does essentially take away the development rights to a certain degree we felt maybe a higher level of um, notice might be just a, a courtesy notice or at least engagement might be warranted on that particular issue and then the third piece being something that we're really trying to draw back to is the vision plan is the you know the master plan for the area and what we feel like um, has been articulated by the community and as we I think uh, Nick really drew from that in sort of making some of his determinations in that 60 foot sort of vision for that corridor uh, looking at all th three of those things we decided maybe this is a little bit outside the scope and we should talk about this separately I think when you're starting to take away what somebody has an investment backed expectation for you would for sure want to have a little bit more of a public engagement process I think well, that helps thank you very much uh, Jim you had a question uh, Yes, Nick, uh, I understand the HDC approved one Congress recently? Correct. Under the current zoning? Correct. Would that make the proposed change null and void? No. Uh, there's no guarantee that's going to be built, number one. I mean, we don't, we don't know. You can presume it's going to be built, but until it's built, it's not built. And um, no. Okay. I, mean, I just thought that since... They seem to be on a path of I mean, they, building they, a this, project with it, the current zoning. That why do we need to change it's a, it? It's a fair question, and I don't know what Mark McNabb is thinking or not thinking regarding his uh, HDC approval. But obviously, he'd have the ability to modify his design. Mm -hmm. He'd have the ability to continue with what he's pursuing. Uh, this really isn't about Mark McNabb. It's about what's right for that property. It's That's, also Nick. If I could add, it's also about some of the things that we're encountering in the implementation of the code. There was something that did go against, I think, an interpretation that um, that particular developer had, and it was that through in corner lot um, and the public pay place issue. These were there was a different sort of evaluation of what that meant, and there was quite a bit of staff discussion back and forth. We it, we issued an administrative decision about what we believed that to mean. We held, we stood by it, but we recognized that there was ambiguity, and so. I think all of these, not all of them, but many of these represent uh, just lessons that we're learning as we go, go through it. Sometimes they're supported by administrative decisions and we are looking to, I would say, galvanize and strengthen those administrative decisions with code language that is not ambiguous. We understand we get into very deep philosophical arguments about very specific sections of the code. We make an administrative decision, but we see the ambiguity and like to close the loops. And so I think that is a genesis for many of these. So. Can I just add to that before we go, Andrew? In looking in great detail at one Congress Street's revised plans, which show a 40-foot building height, that was achieved by uh, picking up a uh, you know seven, eight, nine-inch credit for filling behind the building uh, on the, the future access behind the building to Haven Court, and then a lowering of the building of about two feet. So I, th I think it's a fair question at least from the HDC's perspective, they were not at all concerned or uh, opposed to a, a 42 foot nine inch building, which is what went to the Board of Adjustment. Uh, I think it's reasonable to assume they would want to evaluate it should this pass. What have we lost in the process of, of leaving it green? Is, is it better with a, a shorter ground floor? Uh, is it better with six inches coming out of each floor? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I don't think it's an easy one to, to think that it's a panacea to be at 40 instead of 42, which is where he ended up. Stated differently, and just to build on that a little bit without being application yep. specific, the current ordinance allows you to manipulate things and sort of play games with grade. The proposed changes take that away. It's less, you know, you've got, you can, do, you can manipulate the grade all you want, but it's the lowest of what you, you had or what you ended up with that counts. So, have fun, but right. okay. it's it's pretty much more straightforward. Did you have a? Yeah, Andrew. I was just Andrew. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nick just alluded to it and goes back to one of Craig's initial questions and comments uh, in regard to lot two of DSA. Nick, you had said determining whether that's overlay versus overlay incentive and whether or not it fits into the vision plan. And one of the incentives is that public or uh, um, public use area or common area and 
So whether or not the parking lot of Heinemann is commercial or residential or fits it within the uses of the overlay district, how, how can we get ahead of that so that whether it's lot two at DSA or the parking lot so that it's not an issue in the future? I'm or not if, sure or I understand the question. Um, so should lot two at of DSA come back up? Yes. And they're in the incentive overlay district. Which they then, already are. Sure. Yeah. So then they no longer need their public space or no the incentive overlay district is actually the means in which the, the community obtains community space. So nothing is community space unless you're in the overlay district and the applicant opts into trading an additional story or 10 feet in height for community space. So it seems highly unlikely to me, unless everything uh, goes to hell in a handbasket for lot three and lot six, the lot two is already dedicated to the building permits associated with lot three and lot six. So it's highly unlikely that that deal would fall apart, but it could because anything can happen. And if, if the, the applicant paid the city uh, per the post-closure agreement to retain lot two, Lot two would become part of lot three, most certainly through a merger, and would be a 60-foot building height because that's what's already on Bridge Street, and that's where the frontage comes from. Okay, and so now with acknowledging that, I feel as though Heinemann is in that same discussion just by nature of how these changes will... I think if Heinemann goes green and at the rear instead of brown, you're, you're not affecting Heinemann's development rights positively or negatively. If it was brown then there would be an additional 10 feet of height that would be added there. And that's not the intention of, of certainly this particular round of zoning. I think my thought process is more towards the use, so commercial versus residential or anything. In between. Sorry, the, the, yeah, so we're not affecting any of the uses, right, uh, uh, in this set of zoning amendments. And what I had just suggested we consider reconsidering is the downtown overlay district going as far as the parking lot on Hanover Street in front of Heinemann and maybe pulling that back. You, 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 it seems to me, again, an opinion of one, that if uh, uh, Heinemann is redeveloped and that property on Foundry Place is redeveloped, that there, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have commercial on the ground floor on Foundry Place, but I think you don't want that up on Hanover Street. So that, that again goes to Beth's question about, okay, if not now, when? And I think it's something we should put in the nearer future than, than distant to come yeah. back and revisit and, that. And a conversation as we have discussed in the Talk to meetings. the property owners and see, see what's going on with yeah. lot six, lot three, Heinemann. Well, yeah, uh, even that, the, the, the Rock, uh, Hanover and Hill Street neighborhoods, Pearl Street neighborhoods yeah, as well. Of course. So th that, I think that was my, more my consideration more than anything. everybody pretty satisfied with uh, where they're at do you want a, a short break to think about it keep keep going because mm -hmm. that no other board comments everybody understands everything we're ready to uh, like I said next week I think we're looking at probably looking for a vote on this mm -hmm. up or down as a recommendation to council and it could have amendments some were discussed tonight I think some more may come up as the evening prog progresses, but I think that's what we're looking at. So be prepared. Okay. Yes, Jim. Can I make a request, uh, uh, Nick? Yes. Would you mind uh, providing a list of the individual properties for the civic and municipal lots? Absolutely. I can um, do that. Could I, like, by this Friday, please? Sure. Is there's 12 possible? municipal and nine civic. I'll get them to you. And. Um, could you provide them to the whole planning board, please? Yeah, yeah, I'll give them to the chair. And I like your presentation. I like the slides. They're easy to read. And the handouts, could that be posted on this on the web page for this meeting? Yes. Okay. That's, that's it. Thanks. You also posted a 3D model. Um, oh, yeah. For anybody interested, we have the 3D model, not only the one that was sent out to you with the link on one Congress, and I believe that was the 40-foot version of the building. It's really interesting. Did anybody get a chance to look? Yeah, it's pretty cool. So that's, that's a city-owned product, and we take the graphics file from the architect and, and somebody at Public Works who's the GIS coordinator, coordinator, Jamie McCarty, he inserts it into the model. 
and creates that scene so you can walk around the project. I've got two more from Jamie today that I'll work with Beverly to get posted for. One rains for what it's worth because that's coming back to the HDC. The HDC uses this regularly uh, in order to judge these projects. And then we have two Russell and uh, I'm not sure I'm looking for one more. One, 161 deer will, will be coming in. So um, yeah, we'll work to make sure you guys can see them as well. Yeah, I thought that was that was fantastic. That was job well done. It takes a little while getting used to yeah. flying around, but once you get the hang of it, it's really cool. It's very cool. Any other questions? Nope. We're all good. And Greg, just I looked uh, for the the railing. Yeah. And that that's no longer in the amendments. Oh. Yeah, it's not when it, it's not in the amendments to change that. So it still oh. has the two times four. Oh. Uh, and we should maybe consider uh, okay. bringing that uh, next round. Uh, I just remember reading. Uh, Which one was that? The railing needing to be no higher than four feet. It was in my last version, and, and it, oh. it just fell out because it was food for thought from six weeks ago to get into the roof appurtenances. I do think it makes sense for that to be relaxed so you don't have every railing eight feet back off the edge of the roof. So I, if you don't disagree with that, I will work on it. <laughs> Okay, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we'll have some public comment uh, up to two minutes per person. I'd ask that everybody please be respectful, as I know you will be anyway, but um, this is not a personal ordinance of anybody at this table or elsewhere. This is a proposed city amendment, and any comments you have, technical, especially work things you heard tonight, would be most appreciated. So with that, and if, if you see me raising my hand, you're getting close to the end of your two minutes. And I'd like to stick to it because this is not a public hearing. It is a public meeting. And I do would like to hear if you do have public comment. So the first person who would like to speak, if you'd like to, I guess the microphone. Podium. Right back there. At the podium? Yep. Okay. If no one wishes to speak. And as the first speaker knows, name and address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Duncan McCallum, 536 State Street. Um, some of the, the, at least one of the uh, features of the proposed changes I like is the uh, measuring height off of existing grade. I, uh, I think that's a great idea. I think that uh, most of you know that I'm the one who's leading the charge against the 105 Bartlett Street project in the New Hampshire uh, Supreme Court. And that's the stunt that the developers pulled in that case. Uh, they first came before the Zoning Board of Adjustment asking for a, a variance over the 50-foot height limit. The ZBA said no. And so what they did, they came back the next year. They built up their uh, the so-called uh, new grade with the existing fill. And they claimed they didn't even need a variance. So I'm delighted with that change. Uh, as a general matter, what, uh, what I want is uh, I don't think there should be any raising of building heights uh, anywhere in the downtown area, period. We've got enough big build buildings down there. What I'd like to see is the height limits lowered, frankly. Now, finally, we talk about uh, the, purpose of, uh, the, uh, the purpose of this exercise is closing loopholes, but it seems to me that you're opening one big loophole, which is by uh, expressing height uh, limits on these so-called civic projects, like the North Church, the Moffat Ladd House, the John Paul Jones House, what I think the uh, uh, unintended consequence of that is going to be is you're going to be able to, you're going to allow developers to camouflage spot zoning. They're going to say, well, you know, we're not, uh, we're just doing what uh, everybody else is doing, the North Church and the Moffat Ladd House and the Warner House. Uh, they all have height limits. We're not doing that much different. Well, how much chance do you think there's going to be that uh, anybody's going to build on top of St. John's Church or John Paul Jones House or raise, uh, raise, the, um, raise the heights of any of those buildings? Uh, I see my time is drawing to, to a close. I wish I could say more, but uh, in two minutes, that's the best I can do. But that's one of my main concerns with what is being proposed this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Names of Roy Halsell, 777 Middle Road, Unit 22. The questions I have, 
since I'm not familiar with a lot of this zoning stuff, is are the changes going to be for the city and citizens' benefit, <laughs> or are they going to be for the developer and the builders that have higher and more mass in the construction? And the other thing is, uh, are the, these changes going to infringe on the historical district, on heights and mask, and I understand that, and on the wetland setbacks. I understand that uh, on the heights and mass it won't. But the other thing is, before the 80s and in the early 80s, when I got here, Christmas tree store and Home Depot, that was wetlands. Who, who designates what's a wetland and what's no longer a wetland? That's the question I have for you. That's all I have. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Paige Trace, 27 Hancock Street. For the purposes of this evening, I am not speaking for myself. I am speaking for the organization that is the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America in the state of New Hampshire. Euphemism, which I will continue with, NSCDANH, um, located at 154 Market Street. The property owned by the National Society of the Colonial Dames goes from High Street, which is considered our upper garden, down to the water on the other side of Ceres Street. Our property is bisected by Market Street, but is not considered bisected by Ceres Street. The property goes straight from Market to the water. My question for you this evening, as I stated before earlier at the first meeting regarding zoning changes, is that we are a national historic landmark property. We take our charge very seriously, and we're asking the planning board, with all due respect, to amend these changes to not include our property. Part of it has already been zoned by the city. It's never come up. It's never been an issue. So we see no reason that you need to fix something that isn't broken. We take our charge seriously in this city, and we ask you to take that and respect our zoning as it stands. Part of the property is zoned. We are CD4, mixed use. Part of it, yes, down by the water. You have a small square. Anyway, I do ask you please to amend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pat Bagley, 213 Pleasant. Um, I just have a couple of uh, questions. And I also just want to say thank you for, for doing this tonight. It's been very informative. Um, I saw somewhere in the packet that I can't find now, there was a mention of including a line um, along Junkins Avenue um, by Parrot. Parrot. Yes. Sorry, Parrot Ave lot. Sorry. And also there was mention of the North Cemetery mm -hmm. at some point, and I didn't really understand um, why, if you could explain that. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll wait. Thank you. Good evening. Petra Huda, 280 South Street. Um, I also have questions. I thank you for all of the presentation, especially you, Nick. Um, my question would be um, on the proposed, I, I'm, I'm struggling to follow what we have been given online to what was presented tonight because it seems there's been changes in between. So my questions are, can we have the final that you are going to discuss in a workshop or at the meetings put online so we can follow? Uh, my next question is, um, we haven't uh, actually defined or 
put any kind of restrictions on public or civic places in 400 years. Why are we doing it now? My other question is, um, I'm looking at the map of proposed. I have two different maps of proposed here, and it seems that things are different from one to the other. And for just a regular resident looking at this, um, I took and went back and actually labeled um, each place that was discussed. And my question comes back of why on this new, um, the, the latest version, um, are we looking at changing what we have just above the McIntyre? We have a green line and we have a brown line that was not there in the original. And my question is, um, why are we doing that? And the other questions I would have are, we have new green lines around the Worth lot and the Bridge Street lot. And if you could help me there to understand why and why are we doing this now. Thank you. Thank you. as always. <clears throat> Elizabeth Bradder, property owner 115 on McDonough Street. I thought I had three minutes, so I'm going to have to do the abridged version. First, I want to let you know that I made mistakes on my letter because it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and that's what happens when you get less than 10 hours to read something. But anyway, um, so on the corner of uh, Bow Street and St. John's Church, not Bow Street and South Church, I would like to suggest that um, it be yellow because the parking lot is already yellow, and the cemetery is, should probably be yellow, and the, the building itself, the church, could be orange or green, but if you left it yellow, um, it would encourage people to, re to keep the church um, because they would have <coughs> higher heights. Um, the piece of paper that I gave you, it shows the civic ones, and I think it would be perfectly reasonable to make the civic ones CD4, but I highlight, well, I circled four of them, and those I thought should be CD4L1 because that's what they're next to. The only one that's kind of open for debate, actually, is the um, temple because the temple is next to CD4L1, but it also has CD4, so maybe leave that one CD4, but the other three, in my mind, should be CD4L1. In regards to Foundry Place, I included the copies of how those overlay districts run up close and personal, a little bigger, so you can see them when, than what I presented. I'd like it that you did not move Foundry Place forward on the side opposite of the parking garage. So the parking garage side can stay the way it is, but the park, the side which connects to Hill Street, I'd like you to leave it alone. I'd like you to send it back to the Land Use Committee. I'd like you to notify abutters and do it as quickly as possible. Um, members of the Islington Creek neighborhood met with Juliet Walker in 2019 to deal with all of that crazy zoning down there, especially those two overlay districts. Um, COVID hit, Juliet left. It was asked repeatedly to be brought forward and nobody did. So I'd like you to not leave Brown on that side under any circumstances. I saw your hand go up. Um, and we'd also like to have Hill Street addressed as quickly as possible. So we'd like that to be added as a stipulation for the Foundry Place stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody online tonight? Go ahead. There, there will be a public hearing next week, by the way. Continuation of the prior public hearing. We have a couple people online, but nobody's raised their hands yet. Does anybody online need two minutes? Nobody will be speaking from online then. Nick, did you want to address some of the questions? Sure. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, 
So there, the first speaker uh, had an issue of raising building heights downtown. Uh, other than the, the five foot increase on one property, um, there should be no raising of building heights downtown. And that's been made, I think, very clear. Um, I'm, I, I don't understand the spot zone height, height loophole, but that's something we can all, I'll go back and revisit what was said. Um, it's important that, you know, St. John's and the Baptist Church, there, there are parking lots that are uh, in these civic uh, districts that could be redeveloped. Uh, and again, there's no major urgency of uh, creating guardrails. If people are perfectly comfortable with civic properties having no guardrails and can do whatever they want in respect to dimensional controls, then you leave it the way it is. I mean, that, that, that's, what, that's where we're at right now. There are no height controls and no dimensional controls today. So the idea was to, to use the CD4 and to, to uh, Liz Bradder's comment, I don't, I don't know that you need the CD4 L1 to, it, we're not changing the zoning map. These are still gonna be civic properties. It's only a reference to a dimensional control of the CD4. The map will not change. Uh, so hang on, I'm going. <laughs> uh, the second speaker was asking about whose benefit. We, we obviously believe the benefits are to the, to the people of Portsmouth, the city of Portsmouth. And I think there's, in, in contrast to a five foot increase on one property on High and Haven, there's a substantial decrease in development rights by changing the definition of building height to not game the system by filling or cutting. So you're probably talking a, a, a not insignificant amount of real estate that will be uh, lowered or diminished by changing how building height is calculated, um, which, which is the, the, op, the direction I think the speaker was intimating we should be going. Um, it doesn't matter if a street it, you know, breaks a property or not, it's whether there's public access, for example, on Siri Street. It is a publicly accessible street from one end to the other with utilities and a fire access lane. Uh, so that, that's why it's on here. And I'll look again, but I, I don't believe any part of the Moffat Lad is CD4. Uh, it, it's a civic district, including the kitchen of the Orhouse or former Orhouse. But I'll go back and take a look at that. that. That would be an inconsistency if part of it was not civic but was owned by a nonprofit uh, and open uh, to the general public. So I'll give that another pass. The Paradav lot and the Bridge Street lot and the you know, all the municipal properties, which are, there are 12 of them, and they're highly varied from parks to cemeteries to parking lots. Obviously, the ability to build in a cemetery is pretty limited. It, it might make sense, given two speakers have brought it up, that the cemeteries be limited to a single-story building only because you sometimes will get a vault uh, building, but there's not likely to be anything happen in those locations, whether it's St. John's or out at the North Cemetery or Union. So, I, I, I again, I don't think there's magic. If one story is a, a more appropriate way to handle the cemeteries, I think that, that could make sense. The parking lots are obviously, as we've seen in the last 10 to 30 years, they, they convert to other uses. And yeah, we own all of these, so that's not an easy thing to do, but the, the, the city's looked at some of these for parking structures, especially the Worth Lot, and Bridge Street, and Parrot Ave. Hasn't happened, but um, it's really important for people to realize that municipal properties have a blanket exemption, just like Civic. They don't have to follow anything. So this, this gives at least the citizens a sense of, hey, it would be appropriate if, if you were in this general guideline of a number versus leave it off the map and you do whatever you think is appropriate and let's do a, a 600 space garage that's six or seven stories because we want to want to maximize parking. It would be harder to do that if the building height suggested that 40 was more appropriate than building another foundry place at, at Parrot Ave. That, so again, no real magic. They're still exempt under state law, city-owned properties. But it's meant to, to give uh, some guidance to the city should they ever change the, uh, the land use on those parking lots. Again, uh, nobody's asking, nobody's doing. It's just trying to make the map be consistent from one end of the city to the other in respect to the character districts. 
I, I'm not aware of anything changing relating to the McIntyre, so I'm going to have to look at what the speaker is referring to. There's certainly no uh, idea of changing any of the heights as part of this amendment for the McIntyre, so I'll give that another look. Uh, there, the document uh, that was submitted last week is exactly what's been presented. I haven't made any changes to what's been presented. I did change the order of one item from the document, the front lot line moved to the front from the back. But this should be 100% cons consistent, the PowerPoint, with what was submitted a week ago. So, so Nick, if I could just jump in there, because this comes up sometimes, that we, when we post the documents, the general rule I give to staff is that the documents themselves cannot change, and the presentation can be posted at a later date, but it can never introduce anything that is not already in the document. It is just a sort of a guide to help walk you through the documents. So there should be nothing tonight that was not clearly posted last week. And that's general. We always try, because we do get requests to, after we present the presentation, post that. Uh, it gives us a little time after the documents are posted to practice, to hone the presentation. It takes, a, some of it's complicated, and I think it takes a little work. I think Nick did a good job tonight in trying to sometimes getting a complicated concept presented in a simple way is a hard thing to do. So I think you did a good job. Mm -hmm. The documents or the presentations are getting posted to the same site where we would go. Whenever, get, whenever we're asked to do that, we do that. Sometimes we get them loaded ahead of time if they're done, like I think we did with the public involvement summary report. But tonight we had a request we will post it to the site as well. Mm -hmm. To the archive site where for yes. this meeting. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to take one Congress Street off the, out of the ordinance? It's not for me to do that. Uh, you know, if the, if the city council doesn't want to do that, uh, doesn't want to adopt that, they won't. It, it's, well, but it's ours to present the city council. So if the planning board says that we'd like to take it out, would you take it out? I'm going to do. Well, it. that's that's a this this board this board. If you made a motion to take it out and the board voted to remove that, you sent it to the council with a recommendation. I was just trying to speed speed up his process. If he took it out before next week, we could vote without having to. Slice and dice it ten. Actually, I wanted to say one thing about One Congress Street. In my opinion, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again, that was a mistake. It's not adding something. It's something that should have been in there. It's a five-foot difference. You usually have the same thing across streets and public places. It did, we didn't have that because Nick mapped like my a mistake. gazillion properties in a day, and so he, you know, his marker slipped on one. That's my opinion. Sorry, Nick. Sorry. <laughs> um, but it's it is a correction in my in my view. It's not giving anybody anything. It's fixing something that should have been fixed. That's my opinion, and we we can debate it. I don't see it as needing to come off. I just so. don't like the optics of it from a public standpoint. I think it would be appropriate you. to debate that at the meeting and not at the work session. Good point. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Jim. I have a generic question, I guess, with relation to how zoning has changed in, in general. Does any proposed zoning change need to be approved by the planning board first before it goes to city council, or can they take or not take our recommendation and change zoning on their own? Our zoning requires the planning board to make a recommendation to the council. It's a council action. To if the council could do it. Council can, can come up with some things like it did with uh, affordable housing and, you know, that sort of thing that they did earlier this year and give a direction they want to see something changed about this, which they did. Um, these came about a little bit differently, but they come to the planning board for the planning board to make a recommendation to council. It's a council action to adopt or not. In towns, it's a different process and has nothing to do with us. I'll explain it if you want on, on a sideline conversation. Okay. Is it, however, possible for a for a, a citizen to just go to to request it directly of the city council zoning change? You can without do it, coming here at all. You can do an amendment, but there's still our zoning ordinance requires the planning board to make a comment on a proposed revision. Time, right? It's a recommendation. It's like a conservation commission recommendation to us. But that's that's not true for site plan rules, right? Does the planning board have complete authority over site plan? It does versus zoning. Is that true? Yeah. And subdivision rules. Yes. It's, quasi-judicial versus the legislative function of the planning board and the legislative function is uh, sh uh, is goes to the council mm -hmm. site plan would never even goes to city council correct you need to talk into the microphone okay. they're having a hard time hearing you the site plan never goes to uh, city council right correct 
Anything else? Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll see you next week. Meeting is adjourned.